Next we shall see how to add two AC voltages which are out of phase but operating at the same frequency. In a DC circuit you could easily find the resultant value of two voltages in the same circuit by simply adding them algebraically. If the voltages are of the same polarity you simply add them together. If the voltages are bucking or opposing one another you subtract the smaller value from the larger value. In an AC circuit however the simplest way to understand and work many AC circuit problems is to draw a vector diagram to scale. To accomplish this you will need a ruler for drawing straight lines and for measuring distances and you will also need a protractor for measuring angles. The ruler should have a centimeter scale since centimeters are divided into tenths and are therefore much more convenient to use in these applications. To express the quantities of a sine wave it is necessary to state their direction as well as their magnitude. This is accomplished by means of a straight line called a vector. The length of a vector will be proportional to the magnitude of the quantity. The arrow is placed at one end of the line to indicate the direction of the quantity. There are five rules you should remember when working with vectors. A vector may be used to represent a sine wave of voltage or current. Two, a vector can rotate one full revolution in a counterclockwise direction. Three, the length of a vector represents the amplitude of the signal. Four, a vector has direction as indicated by the arrow. And five, the phase relationship of two sine waves may be indicated by the angle between the vectors used to represent these waves. Here we see a vector for two voltages 45 degrees out of phase. One has an instantaneous voltage of 50 volts and the other an instantaneous voltage of 30 volts. If you notice the 30 volt vector is placed 45 degrees in a counterclockwise direction from the 50 volt vector. The simplest method of finding the result of these two vectors is to use the parallelogram method. To achieve this first we draw a line from point A and make it parallel with the vector at point B. Next we draw a line from point B and make it parallel with the vector at point A. Since the 30 volt vector was 45 degrees from the 50 volt vector then this line must also be at 45 degrees. Where the two lines intersect will be called point C. Now draw a line from where the two original vectors are joined. This line becomes the resultant vector. Now you must measure the length of the resultant vector with the ruler marked in centimeters. When we do this we learn the combination of the voltages has a net force of 74 volts. To find the phase relationship of the two signals use the protractor and measure the angle between the resultant vector and the vector at zero degrees which is vector line B. We learn the phase relationship between these two voltages is 16.6 .6 degrees. This example was used to introduce you to the subject of vectors. Other applications of vectors will be made from time to time in your training in electronics. You will find that vectors are used a great deal when explaining sine waves in AC circuits. At the beginning of our program it was mentioned that one of the outstanding advantages of the AC sine wave was its ease with which it could be transformed in magnitude. The voltage can either be stepped up or stepped down with the use of a transformer. Transformers will usually have two or more windings. One winding is called the primary winding and the second winding becomes the secondary winding. These windings are usually wrapped around a common core made from laminated sheets of iron. If the current flowing through the primary coil is fluctuating then a current will be induced into the secondary coil. Transformers have the ability to transform voltage and current to higher or lower levels. Transformers cannot of course create power from nothing. Therefore if a transformer steps up the voltage of a signal it will reduce its current. In the same respect if it steps down the voltage then it will increase the current. As we shall see the power flowing from a transformer cannot exceed the incoming power. We will begin our discussion of transformers with the coil. After all a transformer is basically two coils which are electromagnetically coupled together. 
An important quality of a coil is its ability to oppose any changing current passing through it. This property is called inductance. When a current starts to flow through a conductor, a magnetic field will start to expand from the center of the wire. These lines of force will move outward through the conducting material itself and then continue into the air. As these lines of force are expanding, they will cut through other conductors of the same coil. This will induce a voltage into these conductors. This induced voltage will be such that it will be in a direction completely opposite of the direction of the current flow. Because of its opposing direction, it is called a counter-electromotive force. The effect of this counter-electromotive force, which builds up in the conductor, is to oppose any increase in current. At the instant the current begins to flow, the lines of force will be expanding at their greatest rate and the greatest value of counter EMF will be developed. If a switch in a current carrying circuit is open suddenly, there will no longer be any current to support the magnetic field and it will begin to collapse back around itself. As the field collapses inward, a voltage in the opposite direction will be induced. This voltage could also be called a counter electromotive force, but it is usually known as a self-induced voltage. This self-induced voltage will be such that its polarity will be the same as the applied source voltage, therefore the voltage due to self-induction tries to maintain the current flow through the circuit. As you have learned, inductance is a property of a coil which opposes any change in current. The unit of measurement of inductance is the Henry. One Henry is defined as the amount of inductance required to produce a counter EMF of one volt when an average current change of one ampere per second is occurring in the circuit. Inductance is represented by the letter L and Henry is represented by the letter H. Alternating current is in a constant state of change and the effect of the magnetic fields produced when the current flows through a coil is a continual induced voltage that opposes any change in current. This reacting ability of the inductance against the changing current is called inductive reactance. As was discussed and shown earlier, inductance is the property of a circuit which opposes any changing current and is measured in Henry's. Inductive reactance, on the other hand, is a measure of how much the counter electromotive force will oppose the current variations. The supposing effect of the reactance is measured in ohms. The inductance of a coil will not change. If the coil has a value of one Henry, it will be one Henry whether it is used in a 60 hertz circuit or in a 2 megahertz circuit. The inductance of a coil is dependent on its physical properties. The inductive reactance, however, depends greatly on the frequency of the signal being applied. In a 100 hertz circuit, the magnetic field builds up and collapses at a fairly low rate of speed and a small amount of counter electromotive force will be produced. However, as the frequency is increased, the magnetic field will move more rapidly and produce a greater amount of counter EMF, which opposes the current even further. As you can see, the amount of inductive reactance is directly proportional to the frequency of the signal being applied. Another factor which affects the inductive reactance of a coil is its inductance. If the inductance is doubled, the inductive reactance will also double. Therefore, the inductive reactance is also directly proportional to the inductance of a coil. The formula we used to measure the inductive reactance of the coil circuits was XL equals 2 pi FL, where XL represents the inductive reactance, F represents the frequency, and L represents the inductance. The unit of measurement for inductive reactance is the ohm. If the reactive value in a circuit is at least 10 times greater than the resistance of the circuit, then you may use Ohm's law for the AC circuit, but you must substitute the reactance value for the resistance value. The formula becomes E over I times X. Also, if two uncoupled inductive reactants are in series, the total reactants can be calculated by adding their inductive reactants together. Mathematically stated, inductive reactance totals equal the inductive reactance of L1 plus the inductive reactance of L2. If two uncoupled inductive reactants are in parallel, total reactance may be calculated using the formula total inductive reactance equals the reactance of L1 times the reactance of L2 over the reactance of L1 plus the reactance of L2. By uncoupled, we mean that the flux lines from one coil does not cross into the other coil. Now that we have learned a little bit about coils and reactants, let's look at the transformer. We will start our study of transformers by looking at the power losses in a transformer. 
There are three basic power losses in a transformer. They are eddy currents, hysteresis, and copper loss. Let's first examine eddy currents. To produce a transformer that is highly efficient and has a minimum number of turns, the primary and secondary coils are wound on a core of iron or some other highly permeable material. When the transformer is in operation, an intense moving magnetic field will be produced in the core. Since iron is a fairly good electrical conductor, these magnetic fields will induce circulating currents in the core material. These circulating currents are known as eddy currents, and they can produce a considerable power loss in the form of heat in the core. To overcome this power loss, the core is made from laminated sheets that are stacked together. These laminated sheets are very thin and are coated with an insulating material such as varnish or plastic. By using the laminated sheets, the eddy current is limited to the thickness of a single sheet. This limits the length of the path and limits the amplitude of the eddy current and holds heat loss in the core to a minimum. The thinner the laminations, the less the eddy current loss. Since the eddy currents are caused by the magnetic field, the higher the frequency, the more the eddy current losses will be. The next power loss is called hysteresis. Hysteresis is due to residual magnetism within the core material. This residual magnetism requires energy from the source to realign the molecules continuously in the core material, which develops heat. The final transformer power loss we shall examine is the copper loss. As the current flows through the wires of the transformer, it causes the wires to generate heat, and the heavier the load placed on the transformer, the greater its heat will be. Most transformers are constructed of several layers of wire wound on the core material. These layers of wire create a tendency to retain heat within the wires. This increase in temperature will cause the resistance of the wire to increase, thereby creating even more of a power loss. As a result, it becomes necessary to use heavier wire to reduce the resistance and heat loss in the transformer. You will always find that more power is fed into the primary of a transformer than is delivered by the secondary to the load. This difference between the input and output power is the sum of all the power losses in the transformer caused by eddy currents, hysteresis, and copper loss. The ratio of the output power to the input power is the efficiency of the transformer. The efficiency can be determined by using the formula percent of efficiency equals the power out divided by the power in. This power ratio will always result in a decimal number less than one. Before proceeding into the next part of the program, let's review the information just discussed. As you have seen, AC voltages are not always in phase. Therefore, to calculate the total voltage of two out-of-phase signals, you must use the parallelogram method of vectoring. You have seen that reactance is the opposition that a coil has in an AC circuit, and the reactance is measured in ohms. The formula for inductive reactance is 2 pi equals the frequency times the coil's inductance in Henry's. Any time you have a circuit which contains both reactance and resistance, the impedance of the circuit must be calculated. The impedance is the total resistance offered to the circuit's total current flow. To calculate the impedance of parallel connected components, you must first find the current flow through each parallel branch. Next, use the formula, the square root of the resistant current flow, squared plus the reactive current flow squared. Remember, if a coil and a capacitor are both being used in the circuit, you must subtract the smaller reactive value from the larger reactive value. After you have determined the total current flow in the circuit, you use the formula impedance equals the voltage divided by the current. To calculate the total reactance for two uncoupled coils in series, you simply add their values together. 
To calculate the total reactance of two uncoupled coils in parallel, you must use the formula inductive reactance of L1 times the inductive reactance of L2 divided by the inductive reactance of L1 plus the inductive reactance of L2. All transformers have power losses which result in a decrease in the transformer's efficiency. To calculate the efficiency of a transformer, you must use the formula power out divided by power in. This number will always be less than one and will be indicated as a percentage. Transformer power losses are caused by one of three things, eddy currents, hysteresis, or copper loss. Eddy currents are losses induced by circulating currents within the core of the transformer. To overcome this loss, the core is made from thin laminated sheets of iron or steel which are coated with an insulating material such as plastic then stacked together. Hysteresis is the result of the molecules within the core material continuously being realigned by the magnetic field. Copper loss results from the resistance of the copper wire used in the windings. The smaller the wire used, the higher the copper loss will be. And in the same respect, the heavier the load, the higher the copper loss will be.